We don't have too much time, right? We sat in uh Yes, it would be great for me to end at one thirty. Uh my you know, have one hour. Yeah, yeah, one hour that's enough. Talk. I think that's yeah. enough, yeah. Okay. I yeah, <laughs> who yeah. wants to hear me talking for Oh hour? come on. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, but you've done so much stuff, you know. It's like I've uh <laughs> yeah, like a singer and composer talking for one hour. That's what we need. Yeah. Right? <laughs> uh, but I, I just want to start with uh, Nightbirds. You know, I, I've been following your duo with Andre for quite a long time, and I love it. And it's always such a surprise when you guys come up with a new one. And uh, you, you know, what, what, what's uh, what's your story with Andre, especially from the, I guess, composing point of view, also and working together. I mean, when did you guys hook up for the first time? I I think like uh, the first uh, the the first time we met was in Boston when I came for a summer oh. program, and Andre was um, already a student at Berkeley. He was doing his undergrad, so there were there was a group of Portuguese musicians living in Boston at that time. So it was how we connected, and I think at, right from the start we 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 played sessions and we 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 kind of started musically um yeah. eventually relationship got deeper and we got married and became a couple now we have a son um and for a long time you know like we would you know each one of us had their own the, their yeah. own projects and um sometimes and i would play in my band and sometimes i would sing with his band but when we whenever we played duo sometimes would be mostly kind of doing function gigs you know or brunch gigs which yeah. would mean like playing all this repertoire that we love like from jazz and brazilian music you know and some pop songs or but never like a specific repertoire and um after and i think like we tried many times to go to studio and do this kind of recordings of this material but it never felt like um uh it never felt like our own sound and, mm, uh, and so at some point we decided okay now now we're just going to write music for each other and we're really going to focus on you know what can work with the voice guitar situation and what would you like to do and so that's how like the first album came about it was really mm. making us focusing on the duo in a much more conscious way and intentional way and you know i think like initially for example for primavera which is our first yeah. album we we thought that We'll just go to the studio and record an acoustic album you know and then it ended up not being that way at all we we started coming back to the studio and and having fun at the studio like doing like overdubs and you know andrea playing multiple instruments and um, me playing two and then having special guests so it was quite a surprise like what came what was the final result of that album you know in the and then i think like not, uh, all the dreams was a little yeah. bit of a continuation of that um you know now that we had kind of a formula in working in studio you know like how to to kind of continue that that work um so so primavera was released like two months after our son was born you know so mm, we had to okay. record it right up to, up to like yes, when early. it was no yeah. longer possible um and then all the dreams was released i think when he was two years old and then there's this gap of almost eight years or seven yeah. years where we have been each one kind of collaborating with many other musicians and and i think now when we decided to make another album was kind of again it's always a surprise you know i have to say i wasn't expecting this result um but then it, i think it reflects a lot of the experience musical experiences we sure. we've had in the last few years yeah how how has this one changed for you guys, like Nightbirds, compared to the first two ones? I mean, like in in the relation, especially of relation of working process of composing and putting t tunes together. And I think, like for Nightbirds, we had a few songs lined up, but we also have a lot of moments of, of free improvised um, 
music and and so like we intentional intention so like we had the we had one session with just me andre and dove and so we recorded some of our songs and then just kind of decided let's just record a few free improv yeah. moments and and okay. and then like that from those moments then we send them out we sent them out to different musicians to add stuff over like to add, uh, to add their own so we 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 sent it to um sophia yarenberg yeah. who recorded some layers improvised freely too we sent it to okyung lee and to joan pereira who's a great drummer in portugal and and so like suddenly these little pieces uh became um they 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 kind of transformed themselves they became like a little little beings you know that was yeah. a little bit like beyond what we had imagined again um but uh, i think it kind of also fit the the ambience of the album uh and and, and there's a there's kind of really like a yeah. An intention of not, you know, it doesn't really matter if it's jazz or if it's avant-garde or if it's pop. It's really more about like following what our tastes go mm -hmm. and also like um, accepting what comes out, you know, <laughs> without yeah. having to label it immediately that this belongs to this place or to that place. Um, and also like I think it, in in a way, sometimes it's a reflection of um, our life here in New York. You know, like how how intense and how con yeah. we are constantly confronted with so many things. You know, in terms of climate change and overconsumption and capitalism. You know, like this idea of having constantly a product and having to sell and having to accumulate. And so, like I feel, even unconsciously, this album became some kind some kind of like uh response to that where it's mm. more kind of like what about this natural world you know what about us and what how how are we listening to each other you know so <laughs> mm. yeah yeah no it makes sense yeah we, we live especially in new york i mean the tempo and everything it's so different than being in europe already i mean it's such for a, sure you know for sure yeah. yes different it's totally different also uh a mentality i mean new york has yeah. an amazing creative scene you know like and and that's the reason why we're here and, and there's a lot of amazing stuff here you know yeah, sure. but there's also an element of these uh you know corporations dominating the world and uh money being all this and this accumulation and 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 overuse uh, abuse of resources you know mm -hmm. of energy of oh, sure. everything yeah. you it's... know like the the amount of trash that is produced in new york per day like it's crazy you know like and, yeah. and i do feel like sometimes we're so busy in this kind of life like producing and working that we don't even realize like how much waste and how much resources we are we're using without mm -hmm. paying back you know so yeah. So I, th I think like uh, the music also reflects a little bit like it's kind of the opposing that, you know, so it's just kind of a moment where you can just sit in and listen and it's not like a, an album that has like specific solos where you see, no, no, sure. we yeah, have, yeah. you know, yeah. like, so it's, it's, it's kind of, it's more kind of a journey where we're asking people just to kind of take a breath and, 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 and sit and listen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I love it. Like it because it's it has this contrast of beauty, but also darkness. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know. When I listen to you guys, it's like it's like Ben Munder and Theo Blackman. You know that duo, which mm -hmm, is also yes. so beautiful, but it's so dark also. And with you mm -hmm. also, I, I, you you have these textures and really nice melodies, but then there is something behind the like lurking. <laughs> some uh, how do you compose otherwise? I mean, when you when you write in general the music, like what's your process there? uh kind of hard to explain how my process is you know for, for i want to say like for for example the songs i composed i wrote for this uh album yeah um for example degrowth was kind of singing to my phone you mm, know like okay. just uh and, and then like 
from that melody, which is ba the melody basically is just two or three notes, you know, like so. Um, but then creating an environment around the melody where there's harmonies, there's arpeggios, there, there's other voices. Um, and it was really kind of intended to be a song, you know, like there's, there was really a, a, an intention of having a, a song form. Um, and for family, yeah, that was also that that family that song for example was just really playing uh, on the piano and and um I, you know I was with my son and I started playing and he started singing back what I was playing and so I thought like I, I want to do something that it's not very difficult to sing you know that it's kind of there's energy that we can really expand not not being all a, a kind of a melancholic song where there, yeah. we have we can have an energetic um and rhythmic piece but it also that it's not very difficult to sing. So, so that's how, uh, because sometimes I, I do feel like sometimes I go to, towards complexity, you know, <laughs> and so, so, so it was, it was good to, to force myself to keep it simple, a simple structure, simple, simple, the melody is not that simple at the end. It's not, it's not that yeah. easy to sing, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, um, but nevertheless, um, it's an upbeat song. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and the other one watching you grow that song was written during the pandemic and mm, okay. i don't even remember you know sometimes it's it comes like from start improvising on the piano and singing and then if there's something that repeats and i i i, I kind of want to remember it, it's like i write it down and then see how can i develop but there's many you know, sometimes there is that kind of emotional approach to composition and sometimes there's a much more kind of conscious, like I want to write, for example, yeah, sure. the composition I wrote for, uh, you know, Primavera, for example, that song was really kind of an exercise of just using one mode um, and then just using the notes from that mode and using, being specific, like I want to write a very rhythmic line for the guitar, yeah. no chords, you know, so, so that song, that tune for example came from almost a puzzle you know where i had many different melodies and many different rhythms and then just kind of just opposing them and, and yeah. see how it worked yeah do, do you do you usually write like for the project or like do you daily write i mean or do you write like you know with that you know let's say you'll have mark turner or andre plane or whoever like and lately it has been that way yeah okay. thinking about the people who are going to play i feel like um yeah, it's been very busy <laughs> so sometimes there isn't just that time for contemplation and and and, and, and so there's a, a specific uh need and that direction line, but... exactly yeah. need and yeah. deadline exactly yeah so so uh, yeah for example when i wrote music for xena and mark yeah. like, that was the first time i was writing for harp for example and also I knew like it was it was going to be a completely different project because that project is a music accompanying a film, yeah. right? So so, um, and the film is already supercharged with a lot of information. So so, uh, I wanted to create something that was let people reflect on what they were watching and with the information that we were getting from the movie from the yeah. film, and also knowing that I wouldn't have much time to rehearse with them, you know, so, so just kind of being very practical also about that, like creating little moments that then could expand into improvisation. But, um, yeah. How, how did you hook up with, uh, those guys? I'm, I mean, with Mark and Zena, uh, what's the story there? And the, the David, uh, David, really, I think it's on piano, right? Yeah. I mean, um, for that particular project, it, it started with, um, an invitation from John Zorn. He, he was putting together a series at the drawing museum, a drawing center here in New York, where musicians played with moving mm, image okay. with film. And, and so I was like, yeah, uh, I'll do it, you know, and, 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 <laughs> and, and in my mind, this was going to be very easy. I was like, I'm not going to use someone else's film. I'm just going to put together some photos and make something. Um, and, and, and I invited like, Mark and Zina, because they were two musicians that I really like their sound. You know, yeah. these are two musicians that whenever you hear them, like Zina has a very particular sound in the harp, you know, and you can 
totally see that Zina and uh, she's so amazing, you know, like, uh, um, I, mm -hmm. I really, I'm really inspired by her work and by her creative approach to improvising and to <coughs> create this, all these sonic, uh, landscapes and like, textures. And, and Mark Turner has been kind of one, uh, one of the idols since yeah, you're sure. since I was a <laughs> student, you know, so, um, and I had never written for this particular kind of ensemble. And, and so it was a lot of like first things that I, you know, trying th new things for the first time. Later on, like I, I discovered, I was researching. Uh, on, so basically this film recognition is about the colonial yeah. past for Portugal. And, you know, both my, both my parents' family they both my parents were born in Angola and their grandparents were born there, you know, so there was kind of these family family stories that accompany accompanied that colonial period until the end. Um, and so I was doing research at home and then I found these super eight films that oh, wow. my mother had never watched them before, you know, it was really like a revelation. Wow. And so then I digitalized the films and then it was kind of like, oh my God, this is like a window to, and especially they were colored films, you know, so, so not black and white. So suddenly you see like, wow, this was not very far away. You know, it was not like that long time ago. Yeah. And um, you see, you have a, a window into how life was in, in Angola. And so from that, then I, I collaborated with uh, Bruno Suarez, who's a Portuguese director. And he helped me creating the scenes and manipulating the images. Um, so it was like kind of a really, I never knew, I, I didn't know that, that this was going to be such a, <coughs> a lengthy, um, an intense creative process, you know, where first you, you have the script, then you have to find the images and then see like, how well will I write music for each scene, yeah. you know, and how will they move and then the whole process of performing was also, you know, new right. experience for me, like where I'm conducting, where I'm kind of uh, doing everything at the same time. It's a very, it's very, it's a very exhausting pro uh, performance for sure. me because I have to be very focused for the whole time, you know, so, and initially it was just me, Mark and Zina. And I think one day Zina couldn't make the gig and I called David Vireles mm. and, and and then it was really nice, you know, it was really kind of different, but I thought, you know, maybe this would work with Zina and David, you know, this would be like a perfect compliment. And, and so then it became a quartet, but I don't think we ever played as a quartet, uh, mm, except for okay. the studio recording. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Yeah, because then, you know, there's yeah, such... logistically, yeah, busy people. Yeah, yeah there, there are musicians like really in demand. You know, and, and, yeah. So we had this, and then the, the pandemic came. So the album was released exactly on 2020, you know, so there wasn't much opportunity to present that. And, yeah. and then we just had a, a small tour in Portugal in 2021 mm. with Mark and David. Oh, wow. Beautiful. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Like, do you still, I mean, obviously you, you, you're, when you tour Europe, you go always to Portugal. But uh, I, I wanted to ask you, like, when you were in back in Portugal before moving to the States, uh, I mean, I know Maria Joao and uh -huh. like as the Portuguese singer, kind of. But yes, uh, like, uh, what were what was your main influence that you decided to go into this direction of music? I mean, like jazz or improvised or whatever we want to call it. Like, when was that moment? Well, I ne I need to go a little back in time. Just to tell you, like I, I played piano and sang in a choir since I'm a, a kid. Oh, really? you know, like, okay. So I did all the conservatory, the classical series oh, okay. stuff, you know. Um, but when I when it was time to go to college, there weren't that many. I never really saw myself as a professional musician, although that was has been part of my life. And and, and I was it was really serious, you know. Like a, it took a big chunk of my time, but for some reason. You know, I didn't see myself as a classical musician and there weren't that many options to be mm, sure. something else at that time. And so I, I went, I first went to art school. I went to art college for two years. And then, you know, my parents were kind of like, you need to go to college and do something. And so 
I went to, I changed and I went to social work. So I, my undergrad is in social work <laughs> and right almost as I was, almost as I was graduating or halfway through that, I met, um, you know, a musician who had been into the classical and had changed to jazz and she recommended go to the hot club, you know, you should try it. Um, and it was pretty amazing, you know, because suddenly I realized, you know, I have all this knowledge that it's really useful. And there's this whole new language that, uh, you know, I can learn, like I was really intrigued by how can musicians improvise, you know, because there's no information on the lead sheet. I was re re used to read so much, you know, and to play what's written. And that became kind of really like a um, challenge for me. Like I want to learn how, how they do these. And, um, and so that's, it, 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 and I think there was really a shift in my attitude towards music, towards, you know, being really engaged, being really committed, you know, every chance I had, I would go, I remember going to a few workshops in, in France, you know, still looking for knowledge. I applied to go to Holland and, and then I applied to go to Boston, mm. which was kind of like, not my, it was never like what I thought I would be, you know, the United States was really never, it was not my dream, you know, it was really, but then so many Portuguese people were in Boston that I was like, okay, I'll try. And then I get, I got a scholarship, you know, so that's how then the move was made. And yeah. And I think, you know, I was a little older than most of my colleagues mm -hmm. when I, you know, cause I was, most of them were 18, 19 and I already had done undergrads. So, so and I really had in my, it was clear in my mind that this is my chance, you know, like now I really have to work hard just to, also show yeah. my parents that this is not like a crazy thing that I decided to do, you know, and also because I realized the competitiveness, the it's so competitive yeah. here, you know, that you really, it's not like for uh, to be on vacation, you know? Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so that was great because it kind of affect, you know, it was good to be working towards a goal and something that I was enthusiastic about and also meeting so many amazing musicians and teachers, you know, that really yeah. encouraged me and, and really motivated and inspired me. So, yeah. so, so that's how it happened. Like in a short, <laughs> long story short. <laughs> no, yeah, well, interesting. The, uh, how important was Ram Blake in the, this regard? Because I know you co cooperated so much in the beginning, I think, I mean, how, how did you start working with him? I mean, he's one of the greats actually. Yeah, Ram was so. my teacher. Yeah, oh, okay. Ren was my teacher at the uh, New England Conservatory. So when I, oh, okay. I, I, after, you know, I was three semesters at Berkeley and then I applied for a master's program and I was accepted. And, and so like, you know, New England Conservatory is such a special place. And I didn't know anything about Ren Blake, but I heard him playing and I was really fascinated. Mm. Um, I also have to thank Dominique Eid, who was my teacher at the time, because she showed me the Gene Lee and Rand Blake yeah. uh, recordings. And for me, that was kind of, wow, it's mind blowing. Like this pianist comping, you know, and she's yeah. able to stay in her way, in her path. Um, and so I requested to have private lessons with him. And so for a year, we, we, I would go to his place and we would just play, you know, and, and that's how, First of all, that's how like I w I started feeling uh, jazz standards in a way that I had never felt before, you know, yeah. because this element of repetition and having a musician that uh, supports me or challenges me and having to repeat these words in English so many times until I find my story inside the songs, you know, yeah. like I think Ren was really the person who who brought me yeah. into the the American uh, songbook and and you know I think like there's a there's a little bit of a anti vocalists anti singers uh, attitude right in jazz like it's always like oh they don't they're not musicians sure. you yeah, know? Yeah. yeah and and f you know when when I was faced with that attitude I was like okay I need to be a musician here you know like so and I was a musician <laughs> so um, 
so I really, but I always felt I had to prove something, you know, like it was kind of like, I'm not, I'm not that kind of singer, you know, like I, I, I know how, I know what I'm doing. Um, and we ran suddenly with someone who absolutely loves to work with singers, has a deep passion for mm -hmm. singers, for interpretations, you know, he knows so much. And um, until this day, he constantly sends me versions of songs. I really, oh, wow. to. Yeah. So, so it, it was a, a, f a breath of fresh air actually to have someone who really loves to work with singers um and, and so like i think like we recorded the album it, it was kind of the result of that year of working together ran played in my graduation recital oh really oh wow and, okay yeah oh, okay. and 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 then we had, you know, it was nice to have people reacting to the album and we performed a few times in, in Portugal, in Paris, also here in New York, mm. in Boston. Yeah. yeah. When did you move to New York then? And how, how was that like for you in the beginning? I mean... I moved in 2008. Oh, okay. So 2005 to 2003, I lived in Boston. And then I moved to, to, in 2008 to New York. I mean, moving to New York is quite brutal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Takes, um, especially after coming from a protected environment, which is a school, you know, yeah. where you have everything for you. You have a room to practice. You have your teacher supporting you, you know, like you have a, and Boston is a small place, right? Small community. And then suddenly coming to New York where, you know, there's no room to practice, where play, paying a rent is expensive, where it's such a big city where it's so many musicians and even much more competitive than what the school was. Uh, so I think like the, I mean, I was quite lucky because at that time when I moved to New York, I started working with Greg Osby. You know, yeah. So how, how did you connect with Greg? I, I wanted to ask you that because uh we connected over um uh, internet he he really? wrote me oh, wow. yes he i think oh, really? at the time when it was myspace he i i had some music posted on myspace and he wrote me oh wow uh, saying That's he liked the music and and he invited me to do a few gigs with his band uh and then he recorded an album and uh, invited me to sing you know yeah. so so that was kind of like around the time i i graduated so by the time I moved to New York, like we, I had performed at the Village Vanguard and I, I, I had performed with him a, a few times in many, you know, the jazz standard, different places. Um, oh. So it was one of those lucky moments, I think, when a lot of things happened at the same time and that made the move a little smoother, smoother. I mean, in yeah. the sense that I was able to perform, you know, and perform with someone and have access to places that are very hard to have you know like um yeah and 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 then it's and then once you have access to those places you realize oh now 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 you have to keep working to continue having access to them and and to the community so yeah, yeah it's it, you know like i feel they that that those first years they passed by so fast you know <laughs> Um, and, you know, I remember when Obama won the election, for example, that was right one month after we had moved to New York and it was quite amazing, you know, the energy in the city and, um, and at the time when we moved, we, we got to see so many amazing musicians like, you know, Paul Motion and, oh, man, yeah. um, Charlie Hayden, uh, Masabumi Kikuchi and Arnett Coleman, you know, so uh, Jim Hall. Oh. So there were, okay. yeah, I know. So, so like, there's this whole scene that when we moved, that it was incredible, you know, to go to hear all these amazing musicians and, um, now it's different, you know, now the scene is different. <laughs> like you have all these elder figures that, um, have passed away, you know, yeah. so, um, it's, it's, it's. Sometimes it's kind of like, I miss those times, you know, when you could just go and hear like, um, one of your idols or a big legend playing. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I remember the first time I went to New York was like, I don't know, 1997, I think. Uh -huh. And I, I think it was the village voice and I opened the, the gig schedule 
and it was like 30 gigs listed for every day i was like are, are you kidding me <laughs> i mean and you know I, I wanted to see like 25 of those gigs so yeah like, yeah and i had money for maybe one or half a gig yeah, no, like, this, I know. Like, <laughs> this is incredible you know so yeah i, I know this feeling it's just overwhelming it's too much but yeah yeah it, very that, expensive too you know like so then uh, you 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 have to find a way of making money yeah and i yeah. think that's the that that was the biggest challenge as an immigrant here you know yeah um, yeah but I immediately you started leading bands right i mean like uh, like i Praia, started what leading bands like praia and mobile those records that you did which are yeah. amazing i mean like, yeah. how, how did that happen like you becoming a band leader i mean praia was uh actually the it's kind of laboratory was boston you know yeah. like i was really able to those were songs that were written during my stay in boston and i was able to develop a band there like um and we actually played quite often you know mm, so, okay. so there were there were some small venues in boston that at some point we were playing all the time um so uh, i mean i think my my becoming a band leader it for singers, it becomes a necessity because so few people invite singers to be side musicians, you know, yeah. so or collaborators. So if you don't, if you're not a band leader, then you never play. <laughs> um, so I think that came yeah. out, and, and also it came out from understanding that I I wanted to 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 sing contemporary music, you know, and and yeah. I wanted to try to compose music. So, um, so I think that was even before moving to the states. I was already writing my music. I was already playing um, and performing and leading, and had a lot of encouragement from Andre and from other musicians in Portugal, you know, who yeah. who were enthusiastic about my music, you know. So so that was really impactful and th so that there, there was a little bit of a continuation of that continuing to perform and and prior so prior was the after um, was kind of after graduation we recorded the album and then it came out right when we moved to new york yeah, yeah. And, so, and we played and toured a little bit that material and then mobile came from also the need of having a new york band and having a uh uh material that kind of reflected more like what uh, i was experiencing once i moved to new york mm. was it hard for you in the beginning to start leading bands or was it natural in a sense of you know presenting your material to musicians and uh, how to lead a band especially i mean i mean it's not it's not easy to be a band leader <laughs> uh it's much easier when you're someone and you know when someone else takes the lead and you just have to focus on playing right because yeah. being a band leader is involves you know like writing the music preparing the music uh, preparing all the logistics of rehearsals and sure. um you know paying musicians calling musicians you know which is above all it's just like kind of takes so much energy and time yeah, um, yeah it's but at the same time, you know, at some point you're kind of asking yourself, like, why am I doing this? You know, like, and, and what, what exactly do I want to, how do I, how do I want to express myself through this music? And, and, and sometimes being a band leader allows you for that, yeah. you know, like you, where you're experimenting with composition, with calling different musicians and, uh uh i don't know like there's i don't think the element of being a little bit nervous of like kind of like not knowing what's going to happen you know there's a lot of responsibility of being a band leader but i think once you find the people who support you or who are easy to work with and who you know then you see yeah okay this this could be a, a way you know but um yeah I think right now, for example, it's more, it's, you know, if, 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 if things changed in New York, for example, like there's a lot of venues that closed, like things yeah. shifted, you know, before there used to be a lot of clubs in Manhattan. Now they're mostly in Brooklyn, Brooklyn you yeah. know, there's a thriving scene there. 
um, it's just like the amount of time that it takes to be a band leader when you're um, self-employed or, you know, when it's you're doing on your own, you know, you don't have a, a booking agent or a manager or anything. It just takes so much time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I know. Yeah. You send, send 100 <laughs> emails and you get one answer. Maybe I, I know how it is. It's like, mm -hmm. it yeah, or you spend months yeah. and months yeah. preparing a tour that will take, it's just going to be one week. No. Yeah, yeah. Every day sending emails and uh, <laughs> it's it's heavy. It's definitely heavy. Yeah. 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 But uh, I, I wanted to to ask you also, like, uh, you know, I did this talk with uh, last year with Steve Swall, and when Carla was still alive, and I asked him how, how they, you know, with Carla they work both being really great composers, and how it's like with you and Andre. Like, do you guys? show each other compositions and talk about how to develop a tune or like if you do your own projects, I mean, how does this work? Um, you know, I think since having a child, things change a little bit, you know, where sometimes you really want your little moment where no one bothers you. Yeah, <laughs> I, oh yeah, I hear you. <laughs> so, you know, the interesting thing, it's, it's more, uh, I feel like we're so connected, like with everything else in our life. We don't rehearse that much. Mm, okay. And, you know, like, for example, preparing for the record, sometimes like, okay, each one of us lends, lends each other songs, we rehearse a little bit, but it's not that we're constantly playing together, you know, sure. or, um, and, and if there's some kind of composition that, you know, we're maybe we're proud of, it's kind of like, hey, check this out, you know, we'll so, show each other. But, uh, but I do think that we kind of respect each other's needs of solitude, you know, them, and, yeah. and silence and, and also like a, a sense of privacy. And I, I, I feel like, for example, I'm very private with my practice, you know, like I don't really like to feel that people are listening to me when I'm practicing. Or it's, um, I feel so self-conscious of, you know, I, I don't think I could do like a video of myself practicing and, and posting it <laughs> on social media. You know, I'm so <laughs> self-conscious about that. You know? Really interesting. Okay. Yeah. So, so I, I really like that moment just to, I, it's not performative, you know, it's like oh, a sure, moment yeah. of exploration, of failure, you know, like, and, and, um, uh, and being very focused. And, and if you're, if, so, so if there's distractions around me, I get really uh, pissed about it. So, so it's, um, so yeah, so so I think it's it's kind of it, it's a collaboration, but it's not that we're always yeah yeah playing for each other or playing with each other yeah yeah interesting yeah uh, otherwise Sarah I wanted to just ask two more things like so uh -huh. that you can escape then <laughs> uh, you mentioned John Zorn before and uh, you know you did his Book of Angels also and uh, mm -hmm. how did your collaboration with John begin and playing singing his music i mean how was that like for you yeah well that was kind of about 10 years ago yeah. and i i came to mikale because i was replacing one singer from mikale you know like i think they, they had a bunch of concerts in sophie i was friends with sophia ray yeah. and uh and sophia called me like saying hey we need the singer like and, and so that's how i met john and i think it was just we played several concerts for his 60th birthday celebration at the Met Museum and and, mm. and then you know there were a few other concerts we went to Australia um really oh wow okay. yeah and Colombia you know there was wow. all these kind of international birthday celebrations and and so that's how I got to meet John and and um and then I sang in a few things that he invited me just to sing like as a you know a guest or yeah. a special guest for a few things yeah um i i really appreciate john zorn like he's a very important figure in the new york scene you know like i i just the fact that he is one person who kind of created a club where musicians can have one week to do whatever they want you know where the money goes all to the musicians you know yeah. how and how many places can you find like that and how many yeah. people can you find that are actually providing this space for a community to do you know so so it's and and uh you know like i've always been grateful for the opportunities he gave me because then he he really gave me this kind of oh there's a commission here's a commission Thank you know you presenting that. a new work you know and, and and when i think at that time was a period that 
I had never received commissions, you know, I had never received a grant or anything. So there's a big value on your first commission, you know, like the sure. first time someone gives you money to create something new, you really feel like, oh, this is really important, you know, like, and maybe in this situation, I can do something that I never did before and experiment with stuff, you know, so yeah. uh, I, I think sometimes people don't realize how important these little gifts are, but they, they are, you know, and, and for me, it was really impactful because it allowed me to create with different mediums, you know, like create experiment with film, then another commission that he gave me that was to present a piece at the National Sawdust. I was able to collaborate with the Nigerian writer Emmanuel Iduma. Yeah, you I know, saw that. Like, yeah. And yeah. That, that was the perfect excuse, you know, it was like, okay, I'm being commissioned to present something new. Let's do this together, you know. So um yeah, so so I have deep yeah. respect and gratitude uh, for John Zorn for um, all these opportunities, you know. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, definitely, he's important. Yeah. Uh, what what about like uh, next year? The plans? I mean, do you have some plans to promote the, the new album in Europe also coming, or what are the future projects? I mean, in the upcoming yeah, months for you? Upcoming, have a big tour with Linda. Oh, Linda Mayhan. Oh, really? <laughs> in oh, and yeah, oh, yeah, oh, super. Yeah. We're going. To California like, uh, in January, and then April will be in Europe, Germany, oh, wow. and Sweden, and uh, Netherlands. Uh, I would love to present Nightbirds in Europe in the summer, so and even in the in the fall of 2024. So kind of looking into that and trying to work around that and. Um, and then the continuous work, you know, of um, mutual mentorship for musicians, for example, M3, the initiative I co-founded with Jen Shu, you know, that is an ongoing work and um, we do a lot of stuff, like it's kind of almost a full-time job, yeah. teaching, being a mother, you know, <laughs> enjoying life. <laughs> yeah, sure, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Beautiful. I mean, there's a lo there's a long project that uh, I'm still finishing. Um, it's a recording that I made with Ingrid Lobrock and Eric Friedlander and Angelica Sanchez. Oh yeah, I saw the, the trio. Yeah, with, with yeah. Eric so and, yeah. so this is a new thing, and and it's a much more personal project. So it's kind of still on you know uh, developing like how to how to present it. You know, the music is recorded, and I'm trying to see like how to present it uh, in public for a performance. Mm, beautiful. Sounds exciting. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah.